Welcome, everyone. So this is the uh, 13th annual uh, Shishkal lecture, and Richard Shishkal was a uh, community surgeon uh, here in Washington, D.C. for many, many years. And the most telling thing about uh, Dr. Shishkal was he was a sole practice pediatric surgeon and always available. And, and you can ask his wife, uh, it's very difficult to be always available for anything. And that's just a testament to uh, his character and what this lecture is all about. Um, and I thank um, uh, Friedman for um, being here every year and also initiating this endowed lectureship uh, for our hospital. So today I'm very happy to uh, welcome Daryl Cass here from Texas Children's Hospital. Daryl did his undergraduate uh, degree at Stanford University where he played baseball for four years. He, uh, he did his medical school at UCLA, did his residency training at uh, University of California, San Francisco. In the laboratory there, he worked under Mike Harrison and Scott Adzik and started in what he continues to do for many, many years, uh, fetal, uh, fetal intervention and fetal therapy. Um, he really uh, did his uh, uh, pediatric surgery training at uh, Texas Children's and where he stayed on as faculty and as co-director of the fetal program there. And um, happy uh, to have him here and glad he accepted our offer to come lecture us today. Spent many, uh, many cab rides with Daryl as we were interviewing for fellowships back in the late 90s. And it's good to have him here on the other side. And he's going to talk, talk to us today about building a fetal uh, program. Daryl. Well, good morning. Uh, I am absolutely honored to be here. I was I was so appreciative of the invitation, and I'm very appreciative of of the family that uh, has helped to support this lectureship and helped support my trip here. My and I look forward to meeting you further this evening. Um, my title says building a. Co Can you guys all hear me? Is this working? Good. My title says building a comprehensive fetal treatment program, and I was I was thinking about like how to design the talk and. Uh, I thought about whether I should tell my personal odyssey, personal story, but I, and I may do that at the end, but I just thought we would start by really doing an overview of the, of the fetal therapy, because before talking about building a program, it, it'd be better to get a sense of what I think a program is. So, let's see, computer's not moving. So I don't have any disclosures, so we're going to just talk a little bit about conditions that I think are amenable to fetal interventions, which means we have to talk about risk stratification and understanding what the natural history of those conditions are. I'll talk about what I think are some emerging areas in fetal ther therapy, and then we'll talk a little bit about program building if we have some time. So I've been, uh, for the last 18 years, in Houston. Uh, this is the Texas Medical Center here. This is a view toward Reliant Stadium, where the Texans play. This is Herman Memorial, Ben Taub Hospital, MD Anderson is all these buildings here, and Texas Children's is here. This is looking now toward downtown, uh, the Williams Tower is over here, um, the Galleria area, and here's Texas Children's Hospital. And this is a slightly older picture because this area right here is, has changed, and it's actually changed since this next photo. And, and the really cool thing is Texas Children's built a women's hospital which is great for somebody interested in fetal intervention. Um, the whole, so, the, so the Children's Hospital Board, the Children's Hospital Leadership runs the Women's Hospital. Uh, and this was a completely new adventure for everybody involved. Um, last year they did 6,000 deliveries. The goal was really to design a, a pavilion um, to take the best care of the baby and the mother as a unit in transitioning that fetus with some high-risk problem from fetal to postnatal life. But of course, it, it develops a life of its own, and now there's a lot of normal deliveries there as well. And it's really quite a nice building, and it's, and it's great for our fetal center. So um, just a quick definition. So what is fetal surgery? Well, it's, it's taking what we do as pediatric surgeons, or in some cases, what we have to learn to do and it's applying it to the baby before you cut the umbilical cord, which is the definition of fetus to neonate. And that can be the most dramatic example, which is doing in utero surgery in the middle of the pregnancy. This is a fetus with a sacral coccygeal teratoma. Or it can 
be right at the time of delivery where you can do an exit procedure to help transition that baby with some kind of predictable problem that's going to challenge that baby's ability to breathe or function, uh, you're going to stabilize them um, for their transition to neonatal care. And why the heck would you do this? Well, the simple answer is just to improve the outcome. And the most dramatic and the first application of this was to prevent fetal death. So there are some conditions where you can reliably predict if you don't do something, that fetus is going to die. And so the, the opportunity is to do something to help prevent that death. Then the next application was to do something to try to prevent postnatal death. So that talks about risk stratification because you have to be able to predict that your that baby is going to die unless you do some type of intervention to help prevent that death. And now most recently is to improve long-term outcome. And that's getting pretty cool because now, now we have to be able to prognosticate long-term outcome. Um, and then, of course, myelomeningocele is a classic example for this. And that was tested with a prospective randomized trial comparing fetal surgery to postnatal traditional surgery, and it clearly showed that fetal surgery provided a benefit. But it, it gets this whole field of prognostication and risk gratification. This field is relatively new, and it's because fetal imaging is relatively new. Uh, ultrasound only came into OB practice in the, in the 1970s. A fetal MRI began to be investigated in the 80s, but the computer technology was slow and they often had to paralyze the fetus, but then computers get faster and faster and imaging gets better and better, and pretty soon Dorothy is going to uh, be able to treat and image, and, and she, the radiologists are going to take over the world, I'm, I'm sure of this, because it's, it's driven by technology, and we know how technology is driving forward, and Peter, too, is going to be involved in that revolution. So the types of interventions that we do, um, there are different types. So there, there's percutaneous things. So a fetus might have a fluid collection and you put a needle in. You just put some local anesthesia in the mom, you put a needle in and you aspirate the fluid. Or you can use that same strategy to put a shunt inside the fetus. Or you can give the baby blood if you need to. And then you can use radiofrequency ablation, which is a, a technology to burn things uh, for certain applications. And then we can, we can actually put cameras inside the uterus and do things fetoscopically. Um, the classic would be laser photocoagulation for twin-twin transfusion. It's a problem of the blood vessels on the placenta. And we go in with a little camera and we burn those connecting blood vessels. It's technically pretty easy. And it turns out that's been tested with a randomized trial as well and proven to be the best treatment for that condition. We can go inside the bladders of these fetuses and, and treat the posterior urethral bowels. We can release amniotic bands. And we can potentially treat diaphragm hernia that way. We can put a little balloon inside the trachea of the fetus. And I believe that that's going to be the future uh, based on our own um, experience with that and, and the evolving world evidence. And then we've talked about open fetal surgery and exit procedures. This is a busy slide, but it, it's a summary of, of the field where I think we are currently. So there on the, on the left there, there are established um, applications of fetal surgery. On the right, I believe that these are, these are probable uh, fields, but the evidence is still evolving. So a fetus that has a very large lung malformation that's squishing the heart and causing heart failure, that is a lethal problem unless you do something to treat it. It used to be that we, called, we said the indication was high drops, and I don't know if I'll have time to prove to you, but high drops is not a predictor of fetal death for that condition is it's heart failure. Um, a teratoma, these are, these are rare. They have a lot of blood flow going to them. Sometimes that blood flow exceeds the fetus's ability to pump that blood, and the fetus will go into heart failure as well and become hydropic. And if that happens, that's a lethal problem, and it actually happens about 50% of the time in fetuses with teratomas, unless you do something to interrupt that blood flow. The, most successful has been to remove the tumor, but theoretically you could do ablative procedures, but so far those haven't been as successful. And then a fetus that has an obstructed airway, an exit procedure is, is the best way to deliver that uh, baby, uh, and chaos is the classic example, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then you can use this exit procedure strategy 
to treat other conditions where you can predict the baby is going to immediately have compromise to their cardiorespiratory function. Um, and you can take advantage of the placental blood flow and the preserved oxygenation to do things to that baby to optimize that transition to the neonatal life. And twin-twin transfusion and myelomeningocele are some of the few things in pediatric surgery that have ever been tested with a prospective randomized trial to prove the benefit of those um, interventions. Diaphragm hernia, so FIDO for diaphragm hernia is currently under investigation with two prospective randomized trials out of Europe to treat fetuses with severe diaphragm hernia and moderate uh, diaphragm hernia, and those are going to finish in the next year or two. And all the evidence prior to those um, interventions suggest that, those, that that treatment is going to have a benefit. And then probably it's best to do something to relieve bladder outflow, outflow obstruction when the fetus develops oligohydramnios. And heart lesions haven't been tested adequately per se, but our cardiologists believe there are certain cardiac conditions where the prognosis is grim and that potentially you can improve that with cardiac interventions, but the evidence for that is pretty weak currently. And the very interesting thing is when we're talking about this field, there's two patients. So there's a mom that is healthy generally, doesn't have any disease, and she's carrying a fetus that has this disease. And when we're treating that fetus, we're treating both of these patients. So that has to be done very, very thoughtfully. And we're very lucky in Houston, we have I've had Larry McCullough, who just retired, and he's an ethicist, and he's written a lot of literature on this whole field of fetal intervention, and he's given some general ethical principles which help to guide the development of the field. And he's participated in a lot of the national organizations that have been involved in this, in this field and helped to guide that it's done ethically. So now we're going to talk about a few conditions just to give examples. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about lung malformations. For one, it's something I'm particularly interested in. But two, it's just a good, it's a good example of the field and, um, and how it's evolved. So field lung malformations have given, been given a whole bunch of different names. I will tell you that this nomenclature is not right. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity for improvement. But basically, these are developmental anomalies within the lung. We think that we can we can, using fetal imaging, we think we can learn a lot about these malformations that can predict what's going to happen with them based on MRI imaging and a no, no, number of other parameters. But it turns out there can be neoplasms in the fetal lung, and these are incredibly rare, but it's something you have to think about. There's some MRI pictures that shows a, a fetus with a very dramatic CCAM in the right lung. This fetus has massive ascites. We do think that MRI plays a very important role for a number of reasons. And it, it, obviously, it helps to demonstrate the lesion much easier. Um, we can actually measure the normal lung in the fetus. And we think that might have some predictive um, value in terms of how that baby's lung is going to function after they're born. Um, it, can help us to, it can help us plan surgery, either in the fetus or if that, this baby were born and that baby was very, very sick, it's hard to take that infant down to radiology to get cross-sectional imaging other than ultrasounds at that site. And we can use this picture to guide our surgical treatment. So there's a lot of reasons for that, and I don't have to convince Dorothy. But um, what are we going to look at? We're going to look at signs of complications. We're going to look at what are the effects of that mass on the fetus now. And if that mass squishes the esophagus and impairs the fetal swallowing, it leads to polyhydramnios. It can actually squish the cisterna chile and, and impair lymphatic drainage from the abdomen. And that can lead to this massive ascites. Most worrisome, though, is when that, when that lesion squishes the heart. And if, it, and if it impairs cardiac return from the placenta, that's when that fetus becomes threatened, and it's a predictor of fetal demise. It turns out uh, this word hydrox has been applied to this, um, this problem for 30 years or so, and it turns out the definition has not been used consistently. And a lot of the early fetal center reports that came out of my mentors, 10, uh, from San Francisco and Philadelphia and even Cincinnati talk about high drops, but they're actually were using that to describe fetuses with fluid collections in one body compartment, whereas it's, it's been two that's the classic definition. And then the assumption was that, that this is a predictor of fetal demise, and for a whole number of reasons, 
for the last 20 years I've been looking into this, and I can just say as a summary that fetal high drop is not a predictor of fetal demise, and I have a lot of evidence to, to support that. It's a worrisome finding, but the predictor of fetal death is fetal cardiac changes on echo, and that's what we use to determine the indication for fetal intervention. You can measure the size of the mass, and you can give it a, a, a something called a CVR, CTM volume ratio, where you pretend the mass is an ellipse and you divide it by the head circumference of the fetus, which helps adjust it for the gestational age of development. And that is very predictive of what happens to those fetuses. And here's some data from our own center. If that CVR is less than 1.6, that fetus has zero risk of developing complications. And in fact, three of these fetuses died in the neonatal period, but from cardiac disease, from pulmonary atresia, from trisomy 18, nothing to do with the lung lesion. But if the CVR is greater than 1.6, those are the ones that get into trouble and that we have to follow much more closely. So we, we do an ultrasound, we do an MRI, we do an echo to help risk stratify these fetuses. It turns out that CVR is less than 1.6. You can, you can really decrease the the frequency of ultrasound imaging, and probably those infants can end up being delivered in a location that doesn't even have immediate access to neonatal surgical care. We do offer steroids, which I'm not going to go into. Um, we can do interventions that are less invasive, like cyst aspiration and shunts, if there are signs of evolving high drops and cardiac dysfunction. And we reserve fetal surgery only if there are signs of cardiac failure. And then uh, I'll talk a little bit about exit to resection. So here's 250 consecutive fetuses with lung malformation. And you can see how clean this is. If, if, this, if the CVR is less than 1.6 and these are low risk, these babies do well. And they don't require any fetal intervention. And if they're in the high risk category, then you have to really follow them closely. There's a condition called main stem bronchial atresia, which involves the entire right lung. Very, 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 very rare, um, and there's not ever been a survivor, and probably fetal surgery is the right thing to do in that instance, but we won't, we won't go into that. If, if there's no high drops, uh, sometimes these remain large, and they might benefit from an exit procedure. These can cause neonatal problems. It can cause preterm birth, like in this case, um, and it, it these can be difficult to treat, and I believe exit resection plays a role in the management of these. Now here's um, early high drops. So actually, fetal centers use this term. They use they call these fetuses hydropic back in the early days. And I can tell you that if it's just early high drops, they don't need fetal treatment and they do completely fine. And if there's high drops, uh, here's 10 cases where there's high drops only, and they all do they all do fine. Sometimes they got exit to resection. There is one baby that died unfortunately at three months of age due to SIDS. Um, but was not on oxygen and no, and was breathing perfectly well. And then these are the ones that develop heart failure that, that cause problems and that might benefit from fetal surgery. And here's a case of that. This was a 28-year-old mom who had a healthy child, and she had some fetal imaging, and the imaging showed a very large, solid, left-sided uh, lung mass. These are ribs, the solid mass. This is the mastitis. This is the liver. Originally, that mass uh, was causing mass effects, but there was no cardiac dysfunction. There was evol high drops evolved. And then when they, in follow-up, they found to have cardiac dysfunction. And you can see why. This mass is sitting exactly on the confluence of the hepatic vein, and it's impairing the ductus menosus and the IVC blood return to the heart. And the little heart tries to tries to compensate, but then eventually it goes into failure. And when it goes into failure, those babies go on, the fetuses go on to die. So fetal surgery is a big team effort, and it's fairly complex. In the operating room, you have to have anesthesiologists trained in, in doing fetal anesthesia. Uh, we have an, a cardiologist on the field helping look at the heart and helping us resuscitate that heart because the baby's in camp and odd physiology and heart failure. Uh, we have to open the uterus in a specialized way where there's no bleeding. The fluid spills out. We have to replace the fluid. We have to give medications to help keep the uterus quiet. Um, and, and this is a fairly uh, intense team effort. And I have some video from this operation. So um, in this case, we did a lower midline incision just based on 
having the best access to the uterus. Actually, it was our first open fetal surgery case, so uh, we wanted to have the best exposure possible. You can see how soft you can see how soft the uterus is, and that's because the mom is under very, very deep anesthesia, and the uterus muscle is very relaxed. We're putting some stitches in to help grab those fetal membranes and help provide some hemostasis, and then we're going to open the uterus between those sutures. When we enter the amniotic cavity, the fluid's going to spill out, and we use this special stapling device, uh, which was designed specifically for this application. I think the company felt that we're going to, it was going to be used for C-sections, but it turns out it hasn't for a number of reasons. Um, now, this fetus has tamponade physiology, so uh, they're hypovolemic. The heart is underfilled right now, so we know this, and we're going to give some fluid up front, just like we would treating any patient with tamponade. So that we're accessing the umbilical vein, and we're going to give a 20 cc per kilo normal saline bolus. And now we're, we're using the cautery. I hate, I hate I hate to see this uh, because it's, I don't like using heat to make an incision, but here we are. We're trying to be as fast as possible. So we're going to make a fairly large left thoracotomy. The baby's head is inside the uterus. The body is inside the uterus. And then we're going to make a fairly big um, opening in the rib cage because this mass is filling up about three quarters of the fetus's chest. And it's going to be hard to get it out. And, and you really have to make a large incision to get this out. The mass is solid. If this is a 23-week fetus, it's, it's very delicate and friable. This fetus weighs about a 550 grams or so. And we're carefully delivering the mass, trying not to tear it. And then once the mass pops out, the resection is really, really, really easy uh, because the hilum is all stretched out, the lung's not being ventilated. And the resection is technically very easy and fast, and we're going to use a stapler, a stapler to do that. And um, once the mass is out, then we're going to... Now, the fetus is not doing well right now because they're in tamponade. We gave some fluid, and now the chest is completely decompressed and the heart is empty. So um, the fetus is quite bradycardic, um, and shortly we're going to... Um, give some blood transfusion, and then we're going to give some medications. We're going to give epi, um, some atropine, and we're doing. We did a little chest compression there just to stimulate the heart. And that that medicine right there is going into the atrium, and we're going to give. And there's a butterfly there. We gave we gave a transfusion into the aorta, and. Fortunately, the heart started to recover, the heart rate got better, and we closed things up. And this was a mass that came out of the left upper lobe, and this is the left lower lobe. It measured 1.4 centimeters in diameter. It was tiny. So there was a huge space in this chest. But the cool thing is, is that this fetus can recover. And 10 days later, the hydrops was gone, and then the baby was born about 10 and a half weeks later, and this is the chest X-ray right at birth. The baby did get uh, intubated, got some surfactant, and got extubated the next day. And here he is, three days of age, with no oxygen. Uh, and there is a scar, probably because of that cautery. <laughs> and the cool thing is, uh, here he is at one, and here he is at three. And he, he's now seven years old and plays t-ball and sports. Now, I'm going to show one other case, but for one simple reason. This is another fetus that has a ginormous left-sided malformation, massive ascites. This was the original MRI. Um, there was no cardiac dysfunction. This looks really, really bad and really worrisome, and we were very worried about it. But there was no heart failure. So we gave steroids, and we watched really carefully. And over the next eight days, the heart function started to get worse, and the steroids don't do anything. That's a, that's a different discussion, but we don't really know what these steroids do, but they probably don't hurt anything, and they might help. But it's the, the benefit of them has been overplayed in the literature. Um, so uh, the heart failure evolved, and we offered fetal surgery, which we did. Mass came out, and the cool thing is the baby recovered. But I want to show some pictures. So there, here's the mass before surgery. Here's 21 days later, post-op. That mass came out of the left lower lobe. Look at, look, at the, look at this MRI picture. This looks pretty darn good. Those lung volumes are 50%. That's 21 days later. And now, uh, 67 days later, the MRI looked outstanding. 
and that baby was born at over 37 weeks, required no oxygen, um, was perfectly fine, and now is two years of age and fine, and the uterus healed as well. So um, we've only done this five times for this indication, so that's not very many. But we see a lot of fetuses with these problems to do those five cases, I guess. And fortunately, in four of those, uh, there was an excellent result, just like I mentioned. And here's our first case. This child was an actor. He's an actor on the Disney Channel. Um, and has his Screen Actors Guild card. So we haven't done formal neural developmental testing, but the outcome has been at least as good to be an actor in Hollywood. And then here's his chest X-ray when he was nine. Uh, no rib malformations. And here's another case at four and a half. Now, it turns out, uh, I guess we're the only the third place in the world to have done this successfully. The first was in San Francisco. The next was in Philadelphia. And Cincinnati, for example, has tried this a number of times and hasn't been successful so far that I know of. Um, and the point is that these fetuses are sick, and you have to know when to intervene. And you can't do it too late. Uh, I like, would like not to ever do it too early either, where they don't need it. And, uh, but it's tricky, and resuscitating them requires our cardiology collaboration. So here's a weird case of a fetus that was now 36 weeks that has this thing. Looks really weird. I can tell you on ultrasound, this is solid. It's very round and smooth and doesn't look like a, a developmental malformation. It looks different than that. But this fetus was in heart failure at 36 weeks with massive ascites, bad cardiac dysfunction, bad cardiac output. And so this, uh, this is now 36 plus weeks. This became clear that we were, the next procedure might be the application for this. And we were worried that if, if you tried getting vascular access might be problematic, that the umbilical vein probably wasn't going to get good cardiac return. And we were worried about the ability to ventilate this baby. And if you deliver them, they're going to be sick. They're going to have cardiorespiratory compromise. They're going to go on the oscillator. They might have to go on the ECMO. And they have this mass in their chest. And so uh, probably the exit procedure is the right thing to do for that type of a problem, which is, of course, very, very rare. And we did that in this case. And we put in a, a right IJ jugular line for access. And then we did the thoracotomy and began resecting the mass. And that worked very, very, very well. Um, and that child was discharged at 21 days of life, and here he is as an infant, and here he is uh, at three years of age. And turns out that was a neoplasm. That's a flit tumor. These are very, very, very rare, um, but uh, they happen, and we've had a couple of cases. And it, and it turns out you can have pleuropulmonary blastomas in utero as well. And I think that exit to resection is the right thing to do for these very rare malformations that stay really big at the time of birth. And there's still mass effects from that lesion. You can deliver them, but the operation is really tricky. The kid's on the oscillator. They sometimes have to go on the ECMO. The gas exchange is impaired. You have impaired cardiac filling. They're giving volume. They become coagulopathic as a neonate. They're having to ventilate the lungs or have them on ECMO and have them anticoagulated. And, it, and the anesthesia has to be done very carefully. And you can probably do that successfully. But the, in my opinion, the, the risk is, is higher. And we began doing exit resection after that first case that we had for those type of patients. And you can see that these are kids that still had very large CVRs of 2.5 or so. And that's, that's still really big. Um, and our outcomes for the exit resection compared very favorably to these babies that didn't have exit procedures prior to starting that um, around 2005 or so. So um, I'm going to shift gears to teratomas really quickly. Here's a classic sacrococcygeal teratoma in a newborn girl. Um, the thing is, when these babies are born with this, we can treat them. Um, they, are, they have malignancy. Sometimes they might even need chemotherapy. Uh, but the treatment is surgical excision. And if, and if they're born with this, the survival, is, it should be 100% these days. But if you see a 20-week fetus with this problem, the survival is 50%. And that is because half of them have very large blood flow and they get into trouble with cardiac failure. And here's why. This is an ultrasound image of the fetus with the big teratoma, and this is the median sacral artery. And look at the blood flow going into this tumor. This is the aorta, and this is the median sacral artery. 
And the little baby's heart is trying to pump blood to its growing body, but it's also pumping blood to this growing tumor, and the two compete with each other. And uh, if you start to see evolution of high drops, that becomes predictive of a lethal problem. Now, I'm saying high drops now. So lung lesions, it's heart failure. In the fetus with the teratoma, it is actually high drops because they, they have high output cardiac dysfunction at this point, and that can be tolerated. But if they start to see signs of high drops, that's cardiac, that's, that's fluid accumulation due to cardiac failure. It's slightly different. And it turns out you can prognosticate based on the size of the mass and also the solid nature of the mass. And here's an example of a fetus that has a very large teratoma, it's basically the size of the fetus. And this mother, 40-year-old mom who had four healthy children and didn't want more kids, uh, we, we saw the evolution of high drops in this fetus and she wanted us to do everything to try to treat it and so we offered fetal surgery. Now look how large the hysterotomy is ginormous because you have to get the tumor out and it was quite intimidating I have to say. Uh, fortunately though there's no bleeding and the membranes are all intact. And here's this ginormous tumor coming out and here's the little baby's leg um, and the foot. And the goal of the surgery is to do it as quick as we can is to deliver that tumor and, and to get it and to resect it. And so this whole operation on the fetus is going to take about 18 minutes or so. And we're going to develop skin flaps. I'm going to keep ahead. We're going to develop skin flaps, and we're going to do a pretty rough excision of that. And we're going to leave some cystic elements of the tumor in the pelvis. We're not going to take the time to take those out. But we, we took out the blood flow to the tumor. And this tumor weighed 505 grams. The fetus weighed about 520 grams. And the amazing, and then we closed up that huge hysterotomy. And the amazing thing, that worked also. And that baby was born 10 weeks later. And she did require a second incision to take out the cystic elements. And it was a little bit tricky because it turns out we cut across this. And those little cysts actually, it, it turned little teratoma implants, like, got into her skin. But it was all benign teratoma. And it required tricky excisions. But everything's fine. She's cured. And she's now seven. And when she was four, I witnessed this girl singing a karaoke to Taylor Swift. So despite, uh, it's just amazing the, the resiliency of these babies. Now, Greg Ryan in Toronto has tried to burn these lesions with a laser or radio frequency ablation. And we just haven't got there um, to, to be very good at that. Um, two of them he tried it on did not show any high drops yet and they died right away. And then three did have signs of high drops. So I think these were the ones to actually try an intervention on. And, and we could have offered fetal surgery, but he tried this radio frequency ablation. One of them died right away. And then two, two survived. So this is minimally invasive, right? So the open surgery, that baby was born 10 weeks later. This is minimally invasive, but these babies were born one week later. And I, I the, the point is, is that so you have this big tumor, and you burn it, uh, it causes tissue necrosis and probably releases a lot of cytokines, and, it, and that's a very uh, hormonally active environment, and those moms went into preterm labor right away. So just because it's minimally invasive, it doesn't necessarily mean it's better. I believe that, that there may be a role for this in the future if our technology gets better, but we have to be careful. This is Greg's work. And same thing with lung lesions, by the way. I just omitted that slide. All right, so neck, neck masses, we, we don't have to go into that. It's, it's pretty obvious that if the baby has something like this, that an exit procedure is helpful. Turns out you can predict who might need an exit procedure based on the tracheoesophageal displacement index, which Chris Cassidy came up with where it, it talks about how far the trachea is deviated from its normal anatomic position. But chaos would be the, the classic example. So this is a condition, congenital high airway obstruction syndrome, where the, the trachea is obstructive. It, it hasn't formed properly. So here on this great MRI is the oral pharynx, and here's the, the cervical, the thoracic trachea, and there, it's missing a section here. And these lungs get really large. There's ascites from lymphatic obstruction. Uh, and it's obvious this baby is not going to be able to breathe properly. So an exit procedure is the right thing to do, as you all know. And in this case, we actually we were collecting a little bit of fluid from the trachea. We put a 
two bins, and this is from the mass of ascites, and then that baby did well. And actually, this particular infant, we went on to reconstruct the trachea, and um, it didn't involve his larynx. And he, he was decannulated later, and he speaks uh, with a, a little bit of an impediment, but otherwise he speaks well, which is very, very, very rare for chaos. And theoretically, you could put a baby on ECMO with an exit procedure, but um, the application of that has not really been well justified so far. So we've been talking about preventing fetal death, and now we're going to talk about preventing or improving postnatal outcomes. And myelomeningocele is the, is the classic example. And it turns out there was a, a, a great set of experiments done at UCSF by a friend of mine who was a research fellow um, in the lab at the same time I was. He created an, an animal model, a sheep model of myelomeningocele, and then his wife, who's a, a plastic surgeon, pediatric plastic surgeon actually collaborated with him and then went in and repaired the back of these lambs and showed that you can rescue the neurologic function and help prevent the hydrocephalus evolution. And then folks began doing this in humans, and the story of that evolution is a really interesting story, um, but it's led to open fetal surgery for this problem, and here's a human baby with myelomeningocele undergoing the surgical repair. And it turns out uh, it helps. So the really cool thing is we think that the open neural tube defect is allowing CSF to leak out the back. And when you seal up that leak, it helps restore the brain. So we think that the CSF, when it's leaking out the back, there's less of a pressure uh, gradient here and the posterior fossa begins to herniate down the plane and magnum. This is called the Chiari two malformation, but when you repair that back, that carry two malformation can correct itself. And here is human fetal MRI of a baby with the carry two malformation. The posterior fossa, there's no fluid here. Uh, there's a little bit of ventriculomegaly, and this is uh, 40 days after open fetal surgery, and look at the cerebellum now. It looks a million times better. And it turns out that that's probably the mechanism that leads to the improved outcome for these babies. So the MOMS trial, there were 77 that had fetal surgery, and there were 80 postnatal repairs. And they found that it cut the indications of getting a VP shunt in half, and it led to increased motor performance of those babies at by three years of age. It doubled their motor scores. So 42% could walk independently without assistance compared to 21% in the postnatal repair group. Now there's a cost. Doing open fetal surgery leads to preterm birth. And we don't ever let um, mothers labor after the open hysterotomy. So we don't let them go beyond 37 weeks. So in the mom's trial, the average birth was 34.1 weeks. And in the standard postnatal group, it was 37.3 weeks. Um, and also, that uterus doesn't heal real well. And there's a risk of, of complications or rupture. Uh, it turns out those can be. Uh, that, that that risk is very, very, very small, and there hasn't been any catastrophic um, events that have ever happened in San Francisco, Philadelphia, or in Houston uh, from open fetal surgery. Here's some pictures from our center. This is the myelomeningocele sac. It's been excised, and now we're bringing the skin together over the top of the of the placo. Now, this is an elective operation. The fetus is no longer sick. The fetus is healthy with normal cardiorespiratory function. And I believe that this is an opportunity for huge technical innovation. And probably this operation should be done minimally invasively, uh, either fetoscopically, and I believe the robot um, should play a role in this in the future as the size of the robot gets better and the, and the arms get better. And I guess I understand the five millimeters are coming out soon. Uh, and then there might be opportunity for other other things like putting stem cells or uh, tissue engineered scaffolds to cover up that flat code that theoretically uh, can help restore uh, neurologic function in those babies. Now, um, it, at Texas Children's, we've actually done this more like 65 times now. So the mom's trial was only 77. And we began doing it with open surgery. 
And uh, now we're doing it fetoscopically, which we're kind of pushing the envelope. And we're doing this with an IRB and an uh, FDA approval, and we're, we're trying to do it fetoscopically. But what we're seeing is the results are even better than we saw in the MOMS trial. Only 13% shunt rate in the fetal repair group. And we're seeing improvement in that carry malformation in 79%, and in the MOMS trial it was about 40%. So um, there's lots of opportunity for improvement and innovation and technical advancement uh, in this field, I believe. And here's some fetoscopic pictures. This happens to be a CO2 environment. So the fetus's head is in some fluid, but there's, there's CO2 in the uterine cavity, and we're, we're doing some suturing fetoscopically to close up this defect. So uh, diaphragmatic hernia, I'm going to talk about really quick also. Um, here's two fetal MRI pictures. Uh, this, here's the right lung, here's the left lung, and here's a different fetus. Here's the right lung and here's the left lung. And this left lung looks smaller than this one. And you think, well, this fetus is going to have more challenges than this one, and that's exactly true. Um, there are a whole bunch of predictors of outcome. And there's you know, been some evolution in this field, um, but I can tell you that um, there are good fetal predictors of outcome, and in our experience, um, the best predictor of outcome is the fetal MRI measured total fetal lung volume, and the next best is the amount of liver herniated up in the chest, and the next best is this lung-to-head ratio. And the problem with lung-to-head ratio, which is an ultrasound-based parameter, is that there's too much inter-user variability and there's too much intra-user variability. Um, it, when they developed it at UCSF, it was one person using that um, parameter, and, and basically their variability probably was less. And it, and it does it does risk stratify patients. So lung-to-head ratio less than one, this is survival, and lung-to-head ratio greater than 1.4, this is the survival at our institution. And here's lung volume. If it was less than 35% or greater than 35% and the amount of liver herniated up, and the more liver that goes up, the less the survival. And the same is true for ECMO utilization, the same application. You see an increased use of ECMO as, as more liver uh, is herniated up in the chest. Now, our outcomes are dependent upon our treatment protocol, and, and you guys are expert CDH care center um, led by Billy Short and the team. and um, you know, we have our own protocol. We, we um, have done an evidence-based review. We try to standardize the care. Uh, we, uh, use cert we use ECMO as needed. And if they go on ECMO, we do early repair on ECMO within 48 hours because we want to normalize the thoracic anatomy and optimize the baby's chance of them recovering from their pulmonary hypoplasia and pulmonary hypertension. And the only risk would be bleeding. We have our blood bank involved in the daily rounds on the patient, and our bleeding risk is incredibly low. Uh, and we've only reoperated on uh, two babies for hematoma uh, in the first 24 hours. And we think that early operation on ECMO is good, but there's lots of opportunity for further investigation uh, in this field. But the bottom line is still, Babies do poorly with diaphragmatic hernia, no matter what we do postnatally. And probably there's opportunity to improve that before birth. And this is the disease that Michael Harrison became first interested in uh, in the late 70s and early 80s when he began thinking about this whole field of fetal surgery. And um, so he actually began by doing in utero repair of this defect. So open fetal surgery opens up the uterus. He opened up the chest. He tried to fix the diaphragm hernia, but then when he tried to put the gut back in the abdomen, it didn't fit, so he created a silo to accommodate that. That's a lot of surgery. It turns out that can work, but it probably only works on the low-risk case because the high-risk one, the liver is up in the chest. And when you try to push that liver down, and it's hard to operate on a 22-week fetus liver, we know that as you can't operate on the neonatal liver. You definitely can't operate on the 22-week fetal liver. You could try to push it back into the abdomen. The problem is the fetus erects when you do that. And the reason is because you can't deduct the stenosis and you cut off the placental blood flow. So that's a major technical problem. And he learned that the hard way. 
Um, but then he came up with the idea of the tracheal occlusion, which comes from animal research from the 60s. Um, the developing fetal lung makes fluid. And it turns out if you block the trachea, the, the fluid builds up, it increases pressure, and it can help enhance alveolar growth and possibly function. And in fact, in the sheet model, it, it pushes the gut back into the abdomen, which but this is a acquired model of CDH. In a human, it doesn't work so easily like that. And so open surgery to place a, a tracheal clip was the first intervention. And then later, it began done cetoscopically. This is the reason exit procedures got created, is because the fetus that had the clip on the trachea obviously wasn't going to be able to breathe, and so you'd have to take that clip off. But it turns out that's a problem because while that clip's on, the fetal lung doesn't make surfactant properly because there's too much pressure and the type 2 pneumocytes don't, don't synthesize surfactant. So it's better to actually unobstruct the trachea at least a week before birth. But that's, then you'd have to do two open surgeries or you'd have to do two fetoscopic surgeries. But a balloon would be the right thing to do, whereas theoretically you can put the balloon in. You can even pop the balloon later. Or you could go in with a scope and pull it out. And this, this procedure was pioneered by Jan de Press, who's a gyne gynecology surgeon in Leuven, Belgium. And uh, it can be done even with local anesthesia. You can put in this scope and put this balloon in. Literally, uh, in appropriate cases, it can take about eight minutes to do this intervention. But it turns out, uh, in European experience, it seems to have a benefit. This is data uh, from 144 fetuses. Um, that have different severities of diaphragm hernia, and, and these are case-adjusted historical controls, and, and you can see that there's a significant benefit to survival, but it's, the benefit is mostly in the higher risk group with the smaller lung-to-head ratios. Now they're doing two prospective randomized trials in Europe. One is on high-risk diaphragm hernia, defined as LHR less than one and liver up, and one is on moderate risk, and we're going to get the results of that in the next year or two. Um, many people in the United States are interested in this. They've been inter we've been interested in this since the 90s for a long time. After that procedure got innovated, um, a lot of us began doing this, and we began doing these in Houston in 2011, um, and we've now done 21 cases. And here's a picture of a balloon going into the trachea. And it does lead to improved lung growth. And this is a, um, a graph of the first 10 cases. So this is the total lung volume, which is adjusted for gestational age, uh, or here. And this is before the balloon, and this is after the balloon. And I can tell you that normally the lung volume doesn't change when you adjust it for the gestational age. It stays the same. And then here's uh, lung to head ratios still growing. and now, but the liver doesn't get pushed down, though. The liver stays there. But the lung kind of gets bigger and gets cramped inside of it, the same space that it has. And when we looked at our first 10 cases, it seemed to have a benefit to uh, historical controls. And in the next um, 11 cases, the benefit seems to have held up. And now a lot of places in the U.S. are doing this, including Hopkins right down the street there. Um, and there's some uh, goal to maybe do a randomized trial in the United States, but we, we, might, not, we might not get to it because the European trial may, may be finished by then. Um, we in, in Houston are currently enrolling into the European randomized trial for the moderate group. So cases we're doing in the moderate group are going into the trial as well. So um, I think I'll, I'll take a few minutes to talk about um, program building, and, and I think then we can leave some time for questions. But I do believe that FIDO is going to be the future for diaphragm hernia. I can tell you that from our own experience, uh, the average gestational age of birth after FIDO is 36.1 weeks, and our average birth for diaphragm hernia is about 37.2. And the problem is they get polyhydramnios, and they do have early birth just naturally. So uh, we're pretty good at the intervention, going in and putting the balloon in, and we're going to get the balloon out with no morbidity, like no downside that you can see in the fetus. It's not going to help every baby with diaphragm hernia. I'm not sure 
it, it, it's not going to correct pulmonary hypertension, but it may enhance alveolar function and alveolar growth and alveolar function, which does help with some element of the, of the pulmonary hypertension but it doesn't correct all of it. And you're going to maybe save some fetuses with severe CDH that would have died right away. And you may save them, and then they may struggle with pulmonary hypertension. But we're going to get better with that management as well. And I do believe that it's going to be the future, and we're going to be doing this clinically in the next five years. And then for repair of myelomeningocele, I'm sure that this should be done minimally invasively. And that's going to be the future. We're, uh, you know, we've now done 36, 29 cases in Houston that way, and we've gotten better at it. Um, and there's going to be a benefit to the uterus for future pregnancy. And also, the cool thing is, when you don't make the big hysterotomy, then you no longer care about labor. And so you can let the mom just go into natural labor. And then we've had at least six babies with repaired spina bifida deliver vaginally. And that has a big neonatal benefit as well. And other centers are starting to um, think about doing this as well, and I believe Cincinnati is doing that recently. And then there's lots of research and opportunity to help with membrane closure and uterine healing. It turns out uh, it doesn't heal real well, and probably there's going to be an enhancement in that uh, in the future. So my evolution into this field like was pure luck. You know, I was a medical student at UCLA. I went to UCSF interested in surgery and interested in pediatric surgery from mentors I had seen as a medical student. And I happened to go, like, where the field was, just by pure luck. And I met Mike Harrison. I met Scott Adzik. And Alan Flake um, was there for a period of time. And Tim Crumbleholm had used to have been there, but he was off doing his fellowship. And Rusty Jennings and others were there. And Martin Muley, this person that did the the animal model is a PD surgeon in, in Basel, Switzerland. And it was kind of the, the epicenter. And it was obvious that that would be something I'd be interested in. And I began working um, a lot with Mike and Scott. And then I went to CHOP with Scott Adzik when he moved there in 95. And, um, and then uh, I did my PD surgery training in Houston. And when I was finishing as a fellow, I knew that this would be like a career interest, but I didn't really foresee building a program right away as a, as a fellow, although I'd done 10 years of training. Still, we think of ourselves as young, young people, young surgeons. And I looked at jobs a number of places, but basically David Weston, who was the boss then in, in Houston, had this vision of building the fetal center. He's a very unassuming gentleman, and he basically gave me support to do this and encouragement. And then I was joined in 2001 by my partner, Olinka Olatuya, who came from CHOP. And the two of us set about building a program. And um, I presented a business plan for this when I was a finishing fellow in 2001. Um, and then the two of us began kind of assembling a team. We were a friend of mine, Chris Cassidy, is a fetal radiologist who was good at ultrasound. And he joined us in Houston. And, and Dorothy and he are, are good friends. And he helped start to develop fetal MRI at the time. And we started collaborating with anesthesia. And uh, now our OB partnership was kind of has gone through a lot of evolution because of OB situation in Houston. And every, every city has its own unique OB relationships and MFM partnerships. And we, we've, we've worked with private practice MFMs. We've worked with academic MFMs. And, it, and it's gone through a whole bunch of phases. And we worked with fetal interventionists. That, like, that's what they do as MFMs. They do a lot of fetal interventions. Um, and we worked with general OB and general MFMs. And we worked with a whole different group. Um, but beginning in 2011, uh, the hospital went through a big change. And it built this women's hospital. And then we had a no, new ob guy chairman come in. And he hired a whole bunch of MFMs, and, and he helped solidify a program um, that is a huge program now that has four PD surgeons that do fetal surgery. It has four um, MFMs that pr primarily focus on fetal intervention. It has four fetal radiologists that do fetal MRIs every day. 
has six nurse coordinators, has three intake coordinators, it has three administrators that are assigned to this program, and it's a pretty big deal, um, and it's a pretty a busy program. And how these programs get developed uh, just depends on where you are. Um, you know, the first was, and it's, it's evolved, the field has completely evolved because originally this was more boutique because we were talking about life-threatening problems which are very rare, they're hard to do, and requires expertise, and probably it's better that there were more regional centers. But now with myelomeningus seal, that is a pediatric surgical condition. It's led by neurosurgeons, but it's a pediatric surgery condition that's done in children's hospitals. And it's really becoming the standard of care. That, that term standard of care has a lot of legal implications. But, but, that is, but that is the care that is the best evidence, let's put it that way. So if you're not doing that, then you're not giving the best evidence-based care for that particular problem. And uh, so it's a new era. And that began only in 2011. So now all children's hospitals have become interested in this. So uh, the, the program first was UCSF and then CHOP. And we, we were the third to get set up beginning in 01. And then Cincinnati was about 05, uh, 06. And then Kim Crumbleholm moved to Denver. Cincinnati still goes. And then he created Denver in about 2011. Vanderbilt really has been involved only in repair of spina bifida, and they haven't done other um, fetal surgery cases. And now um, Cardinal Glennon in St. Louis does fetal repair of myelomeningus heel. Uh, Herman down the street from us in Houston does it. That's politics uh, and the whole story. Uh, Minneapolis, Milwaukee, Ann Arbor, Michigan, Oshner Clinic in Louisiana. I think those are the first 11 open fetal repairs of myelomeningus seal. Boston has just done the heart interventions, never done open fetal surgery. And now uh, other places are going to do it. And I don't know, Hopkins will be doing it soon. And uh, Chicago is planning. Interestingly, open fetal surgery has never been done in New York City, Chicago, or Los Angeles. But uh, Chicago is the closest to building a program, probably it's going to take a couple of years. A lot of places are interested in this, and how you build your program is really dependent upon the local environment and your local resources and, and team. Essentially, you have to build a team. You have to figure out where you're going to do them, and where you do them has to provide labor and delivery level maternal fetal care, and so you have to create the infrastructure for that, and then you have to get successful at doing it, and then you, you know, you have to have outreach to, to help. Um, inform the public and, and other referring doctors of what you're doing. But anyway, I'll, I'll close at that, and um, I thank you very I'm sorry to kind of went through some of this so quickly, but I just wanted to provide an overview, I guess, from my perspective, and I really appreciate your attention. Thank you.